Hi friends, welcome to another episode of Complex Like Wine, the podcast where we talk about complicated things and improve over time just like wine does. This is the 20th episode, believe it or not. I've been doing this for 20 weeks, so that's pretty crazy. So if you've been listening since the first episode, you're awesome. I thank you so much. This week we have David with us, and I met David through school, and so awesome creator, does a lot of cool different projects, and so learn a little bit more from him. But of course, like always, we have to talk about the wine. So this week I have a white. It's a Falangia or a trying to been doing research on how to pronounce all these words in Italian and I still butcher it. <laughs> Falangia, I think. So it's that's the type of grape and it's prized variety native in the Benevito region and harvested in September to produce a straw colored wine with fruity and floral perfumes. As a dry balance and fresh flavor, it tastes great with seafood, white meats, and grilled vegetables. And this is by the winery Pidu di Cali. And so, of course, cheers if you're also drinking wine if you're listening. <laughs> Definitely dry. If you like dry wines, I would really recommend this one. I think it's a little bitter for my preference, but it's pretty good. I think if you're on the drier, bitter white wines, this one I highly recommend for you. So definitely check it out. Links in the bio, of course. But yeah. Hi, David. How are you doing? <laughs> good. Good. Really good. Thanks for uh, for having me on. Wow. Tw- has it really been 20 episodes? You know, I've been, I've been listening, I think, since you started this and doesn't feel like 20 episodes. It feels like just yesterday you started the show. Um, but really, it's been, you know, so helpful for me, at least. And, uh, you know, every time there's there's always something that I can relate to or something that I can empathize with. And each each person that you have on helps me look at things through a different perspective. So I hope that I can also give that to anybody that does listen uh, to this one. And hopefully, you know, I can give something of value to them, whether it's through my words or something else. Um, but yes, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is David. Uh, I met Zyra in, what was it, 2018 something? I think 2018, yeah. So we both went to school together. Um, and uh, yeah, I did. At the time, I did a lot of film-related stuff. I've since transitioned into podcasting and um, more creative writing, um, types of endeavors and it's just really been an interesting past couple of years and um, yeah it's it's really been um, <clears throat> it, 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 it's crazy how our mentalities change um, or not our mentalities but it's crazy how our outlooks will change on the things we want to do uh, depending on what happens to us right after I had left uh, my school the first year I had gone through some major uh, just physical and mental challenges that really um, put me in a really bad state of mind for almost a year. Um, I had gone to Texas afterward, shortly afterwards uh, to volunteer for this organization that helps rebuild houses uh, for the Hurricane Harvey relief effort. And I did that for a few months. And in that is when I started really finding that podcasts were my sort of uh, my, my realm, my, you know, my safe place. And it was really interesting. I started listening to a lot of podcasts, um, Station Arcadia being one of them. And it was just such a different medium compared to anything really. I had never really messed with podcasts before and it's just so much more freeing. It's a lot more, uh, imaginative. You can really picture, you could take a hundred different people and they can tell you a different description of what's going on. But at the end of the day, you still kind of get a general idea of the story or the message or whatever, depending on the type of podcast it is. But anyway, uh, for me in that time, my biggest problem or my biggest challenge, I should say, was learning to get over this imposter syndrome that I had. And I've, I've had this since 
I so ever since I started anything creative, I've always had this idea that like nothing I ever do is good. This idea that no matter how much I do, I never improve and, and all these other things. And despite what people might tell me to say, Oh, this is really good. Or this, I really enjoy your show or whatever it might it might be to this day. I still have a problem with receiving compliments with accepting, you know, if something is good that I do, or if it is noteworthy and I have a problem just accepting that. And sadly that does affect my work. And then it becomes less qual uh, quality or the quality does suffer because of that mentality. So it's really such a, uh, uh, such a weird thing that, and I, I know a lot of people struggle with it too, but I, I don't know, you know, that's something that I'm still struggling with now. And on, to be honest, I've never really found something that has truly been able to help me stop thinking that way um i don't know you know is that something that you deal with is that something that uh and if you do and it, or if you ever have you know what's what's um what's a way that you've dealt with it i'm curious to uh to know that if if you would share yeah yeah so imposter syndrome 100 percent. i think any creative or any creator, whether it's artistic or you're starting a business or trying to get into a career, you're always going to have the voice in the back of your head telling you you're not qualified, you're not acceptable, you're not talented enough. There's going to be so many reasons why. And so for me, whenever I would start my films or even with this podcast, there was a lot of the inner anxiety of, I have these really cool ideas, but what if no one wants to see it or no one wants to listen or people think it's bad or for me i can be such a perfectionist and so like, but i don't have the best quality mic or i don't have this, like walls all soundproofed and everything it's like what if the quality is not good enough and people won't want to listen to it at all and i think you just have to at least for me i've had to just really hunker down and sit with those thoughts and really do some reflection of why am I talking to myself this way? Would I talk to my friends or other creators that way? And the answer is no, I would never. And there's something about giving yourself compassion and being learning the way you treat others, treat yourself that way. There's a post I saw today where it said like, the amount of anxiety, the amount of stress, the amount of criticism you give to yourself, it's not productive. It doesn't solve anything. And so learning that switch of me treating myself so badly and doubting my abilities that as much as I might think in my own way of what's going to give me more motivation to be better, it just really keeps you in a limited perspective of what you can do. And so now I just kind of you bite the bullet, say F it and just do it. And like with this podcast where I was so anxious to release the first few episodes and having you listening since the first one and receiving feedback from you about it. And now you're on the podcast. It just shows people will be touched and will appreciate your work no matter what you think. And it's just being able to be vulnerable with yourself and step out of it. and. Just kind of, at least for me, when it's out of sight of mind, I just don't look at the how many listens it's getting or the analytics. I just post it and, you know, it's out there. The purpose is for other people to relate to, to connect with. And so it's just kind of knowing that the reasons you're creating stuff is bigger than yourself. At least that's what has helped me most recently when it comes to imposter syndrome. Yeah. Yeah, that, you know, and <clears throat> that that's really solid. And it's just, you know, to kind of sum that up, it's just been something that I think is, like you said, it, you, as a creator, as an artist, you're all, and anybody that really just does anything um, that they like or that they love, there's always going to be this little voice or this little feeling like, you know, am I good enough to be doing this? You know, should I keep doing this? Is it worth it? You know, and so definitely, I think that's a, uh, a really good, you know, solid way of dealing with that is you, you just, you got to deal with it. And uh, you, you have to remember that there are people that do like it as much as you may not see it, or you may not choose to see it. There's so many people that are 
wanting to listen to what you have to say. They want to listen to the stories you create. Um, and that's something that I think um, I know will help me is just remembering, even if it's one or two people, that's a difference. As long as it's one person, you're making a difference, right? Mm -hmm. And that kind of leads into the next sort of thing I kind of had in mind too was, you know, the, this, the, the sense of validation for me too, as, as you were saying, you know, try not to look at how many people are listening. Try not to look at the analytics. And for me, I've always been so not keen, but I've always been so adamant about making sure that that continues to grow and that that just doesn't stay stagnant. Um, and then that's when that imposter syndrome will kick in for me. But I think it's important as creators, and especially if you're in an independent world, if you're a newer creator and you have friends that are newer creators, it's really important to support each other. And, you know, uh, support can mean many things. It can mean, you know, donating $5 to their Patreon, or it could just mean sharing a post that they make, or it could just be telling them that you support them. And any, any form of positive uh, interaction with them, whether it's direct or indirect, can make a world of difference for people. And I think for me, that's something that, you know, and I don't want to put it like, you know, oh, woe is me. But that's something that I, I feel like I don't really get a whole lot of. And it's because I deny it when people tell it to me. So I almost feel like people don't tell it to me because they know I'll tell them like, no, 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 no. Or they know I'll like push it away. Um, and I've seen that happen. And I think as it just, again, whether you're an audience member or a creator artist, it, it's just, it's so important to support each other in, in any sort of way, because we're all struggling to make it in, you know, whatever definition of the success each individual has, we're all trying to grow. We're trying to, you know, make our shows, our projects known to the, to the bigger uh, world out there um, because we want people to like it. We want to be proud of our stuff. We want it to get that attention for whatever reason. And so um, that's something that I see a lot or that, excuse me, that I don't see a lot of as much as I think there should be in the podcasting community, especially is just this sense of community. And this is really with any media platform. It's become so much about, you know, if I don't really know you or if like you haven't done anything for me, I'm not going to do anything for you. I'm not going to support you. And it, to me, that's something that I've noticed a lot. And it's, it's happened to me personally quite a few times. And, uh, you know, I just, I, I know I would never do that to somebody because I can't imagine how it feels if someone did that to me again. And so it's just, I feel like there needs to be a, a more sense of, a, there needs to be a better sense of community in any media, whether it's art, whether it's uh, like physical art, whether it's podcasting, film, uh, TV shows, whatever it may be, um, because at the end of the at the end of the day, that's what's going to keep us going is supporting each other. And even if you don't know the person, if you see that they're struggling or you see that, you know, they could use that boost. You know, I'm not saying you have to go share everything they have. I'm not saying you have to donate to their campaign, but even just saying, you know, I don't know you or introducing yourself. That's the other thing too, is a lot of people go into this mentality of I'm going to make relationships with so-and-so so that I can better my show or so that I can better my mutual relationships. And I hate that so much. And because, and, and it's just because people get used for who they know or what they know. And so people will throw this curtain of, oh, I'm going to be friends with you when they're really not. And they're just in it for themselves. And that's also something that has happened to me a lot recently. And it's just, it's really disheartening and it's really demoralizing when you find out that that's really what happened. And, you know, I can't say I'm completely innocent of that. I know I used, I, I had done that a couple of times when I was first starting out, but I quickly realized just you know, how negative that is for everybody involved, because one, not only does it hurt them and, and you're hurting them, but two, you know, you're hurting yourself. You're, you're putting a bad uh, rep out there for yourself by saying, I'm only here to make friends with you to better myself. And so I, I, I don't know if you've had much experience with that. I don't know what your thoughts on that are, but that's just something that really popped into my mind is a lot of people 
in any media form seem to be doing that a lot more nowadays. And it's kind of, and especially with social media, it's just, it's kind of, kind of disheartening for me, but. No. Yeah. I think in any field, whether it's media art or kind of corporate world, you're always going to encounter people that don't have the integrity or are kind of out for themselves right now. I'm starting a book by Adam Grant called Giver and Takers. And it's about, the types of people in like the war field are you the giver where you make sure everyone's okay and taken care of at the account of your expense or are you someone that makes sure you're okay at the account of everyone else's expense and it's really interesting to see and in the bucket describes givers are usually at the very bottom and also at the very top and takers are just somewhere in the middle and so to go back to answering your question i have definitely experienced people that for whatever reason, whether it's insecurity, jealousy, they are just kind of a shit person <laughs> or for whatever reason where, you know, they're on your set or on your project, part of your team, but in some way or another manipulated to benefit them or to sabotage your work. And on one of my short films, I definitely experienced that. It was a really traumatizing might be a strong word, but it definitely stuck with me for a while where I was kind of reflecting like, is this what I want to do? If people are like this, is this really how I want to invest my energy with? And especially when you're in the media, you really have to collaborate and that can be really awesome or really crappy. <laughs> it can, you're going to always have both. And like what we've kind of talked about before, it's yeah, just being self-aware and realizing there's always going to people yeah. are that, are like that. They're, they're not going to go away anytime soon. It's just he, part of the human experience where you have really amazing people and just people that you don't want around. But it's being able to be confident with yourself and really learning how to distinguish the red flags with meeting other collaborators and understanding no, don't be closed off. Don't be a taker where you're going to cover your ass and expense of everybody, but also be logical and be smart. Don't be naive and I mean, like making sure you're taken care of and who else you can like take care of with you. And if someone is trying to get under that, you respectfully separate ways or cut them off. And it's a learning curve. It's really hard. I'm still at times trying to figure that out, but I think especially when it comes to media, you have to unfortunately have a tough skin. And mm -hmm. now I guess is our generation, we need to figure out how can we change the mentality of you need to be harsh and cruel because you need to like weed out all the weak people. And how do we make it where it's a family team, a unit? How can we support each other? Yeah, definitely. And it's interesting because when you, when you talk about, uh, lacking integrity too. It's it's funny because I've noticed too, as I've gotten older and as I grew into an adult, I noticed that having integrity can be, and I'm not saying don't have integrity, but it's weird because in places that I've worked, especially corporate, but having integrity can really backfire on you because people will take it as you being disingenuous or people will think you're being sarcastic. And to me, it's just always amazed me how, like how, how many people think that just being nice means that you're out there for some like ulterior, this is the other side of that spectrum is where, you know, you got to be nice to people and you can't be doing that. But uh, the other side of that too, a lot of people perceive that at least in my experience as, you know, someone being out there for their own motive and maybe it's because they're insecure and they've had that happen before but maybe i'm too nice maybe i'm too forgiving if there can be such a thing but i try to never really take kindness as disingenuous i'd rather give someone the benefit of the doubt because why i i don't know i think having that constant you know anxiety at the back of your head is just unhealthy and it's it, it's going to turn it did for me at one point, it's going to turn you into a, a more bitter person and then you won't be able to trust anybody at all. And I can understand when that does happen again, because that has happened to me when someone is disingenuous to you and they do use you that you want to just close up and you don't want to open yourself back up to the rest of the world. And so, 
for me, the way that I coped with that and the way that I kind of came over that was realizing that more often than not, people will be genuine. And, you know, while they might have another reason, you know, we all do to some extent, we all have our reasons for collaborating with people, you know, obviously we know it might better ourselves, but it might also better them and it might also better our relationship. So yeah, that's also why I'd want to do that. So I think it's really just, if your primary and only reason is for yourself, that's when it becomes a bad thing. But if you have this uh, idea of, oh, it's going to benefit both of us and who knows where might go from there. I think that that's okay. And I think that that's, um, if anything, the mentality we should have is um, if you're going to make a collaboration with somebody, you know, what benefit do you both get from it? Whether it's social media influence or so on, yada, yada, yada. Um, no, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's really interesting. But were you, were you going to say something? I don't know if I just cut you off. Oh, no, no, no. I, w- I wanted to jump on that. I think we mentioned of when you have the expectation that people are out to get you or they're like having a motive when it's unhealthy and it's also exhausting and there's kind of the thing of if you perceive somebody's out to get you, you're going to manifest it to be that way. Mm -hmm. But there's just something about, you know, giving people the benefit of doubt, just being yourself. Don't let people make you sour or, you know, compromised in being kind and helpful. You know, if you're putting that energy that they're going to be that way, you're going to be more, able to manifest it to that direction but there's also a thing of if you notice a red flag or you notice something's off you know okay you can put some barriers up you can just be more mindful and like more observant of how things are yeah absolutely and i think you know i think there is a point as well where you know you can be doing too much and you can be too intrusive to start and and you can be very straightforward and um i think Again, there's another side to that where if you are being genuine to someone and you are wanting to, you know, express your kind or whatever it may be, there is also a way of going about it because if you do too much or you do it incorrectly or in a very concerning manner, um, naturally people will be suspicious and naturally, you know, someone might take it the wrong way and you might not be able to fix that. Um, so it's also important, I think, to really, uh, be mindful, as you said, about just your surroundings, both for being careful of other people and then also for being kind and being, you know, offering something to other people. It's, it's both ways it works. Um, it's a two way, two way street. I think that's how that saying goes. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, but yeah, definitely. Um, trying to think what else did we, uh, what else was there? Um, you mentioned about like changing career paths. Yeah, um, that was the other thing. Um, I got to say, I've always been a storyteller in some capacity. I've always wanted to convey either stories that are my own or retell character arcs and, and, and different types of stories. So you have like the hero's journey, the heroine's journey, and then you have arcs like the Byronic hero, you you know, and so on. And I've always been fascinated with these types of stories and and the messages that they tell about, you know, the way we live and about the human psyche. And uh, ever since I was a little kid, I always, you know, I remember when my dad, 2004 or five, when I was in kindergarten, something like that, he gave me an old work computer that, you know, those big white box computers um, with the giant... um, white speakers that you'd plug into the back and everything. And I remember he gave me that computer and he and I would sit down and I would, you know, play games. But the thing I would do the most was I would go on to windows movie maker, uh, record something off of his camcorder that I would borrow. Um, and then like make movies out of it. I found a way to rip music from discs. I found ways to uh, do slides and transitions. And, you know, as a five-year-old, you look back and it's like, oh, that's that's cute that a five-year-old, you know, would do that. But, you know, that's where that creativity really sparked was I, I really got to thank my dad for giving me that ability at a very young age to be able to do that. Um, but so always been a storyteller, always wanted to do something relating to that. When I started college, 
I went in <laughs> thinking that I knew I'm going to be an editor. I'm going to be a sound designer. I'm going to be um, one of those two things for, for uh, the film industry. I'm going to go into the film industry. I'm going to do these things. I'm going to be really successful. And I didn't know what successful meant. I just knew I was going to be successful. I was determined. And that first year was really successful. I also found out that I was a writer in that class, in a class that I took. And, um, you know, not only did I get support from my peers, but, you know, I remember I would sit down with my professors after classes and I would just talk with them about story ideas that I had. And, and uh, I remember a specific professor, uh, Professor Vance, he would tell me that these stories you know, just sounded so creative or they, you know, and he would also challenge my stories. He would say, okay, why is it you're wanting to tell this? Or why would this character do this? Why would so and why would this happen? And it would always cause me to go back, write it again. And, you know, that helped me feel like a better storyteller. So after I left that first year, because of the things that had happened in my life, I'm like, okay, I'm still going to do film, but now I'm going to do podcasts as well. And then, um, I went to Full Sail University for a year, did their film package, did a whole year's worth of film classes, did some stuff on a set. And I was like, you know what? Yeah, I'm definitely going to be an editor. I'm going to, you know, I- I'm going to edit big movies and all these things. And then the last year would come around and uh, I had a huge project, a huge film project that I was going to do. I had started the uh Indiegogo campaign for it, everything. I had built up the audience on a bunch of different social medias over the last two years. I had everything written out. I got a huge bunch of actors, some which were just starting to make their way into the industry. Um, and I knew that that would be good for both of us. Um, I got amazingly talented, you know, VFX artists, a composer, everything that you could possibly need for like a, a huge budget without the budget film um and a lot of people either would do it for volunteer or uh i would do work for them or something like that but that campaign never got funded that campaign got maybe 12 percent of its funding despite our huge audience despite the social media influence that i had with it and i was honestly really not only shocked but i was just i was so upset for the longest time and that's when that imposter syndrome really took full effect and i i kept telling myself i'm not good enough for this you know clearly people don't like the things that i do because you know it didn't do this and i had so many social media influencers like retweeting it and talking about it on their websites i got into the new york times on a newspaper article and it still didn't get funded so you know i I was just so grief stricken and I'm like, all right, I'm done. I'm not going to be a storyteller anymore. I'm just done with this. And then, so throughout all that time, I would switch from being a filmmaker to criminal justice, to uh, marine biology, to uh, working at a zoo, uh, being a zookeeper, senior zookeeper for reptiles, herpetologist. And then that would just change so much. And the worst part about it was, is I never felt like I had a hundred percent support because my parents are divorced and they're always busy with what they're doing. I don't have any siblings that are my age. All my siblings have their own families or they're out in other States. Um, And the other thing is too, especially because of COVID, I don't feel like I have a lot of friends as much as many friends as I used to have, or at least even acquaintances that I used to have people that I could at least talk to. And since COVID started, that depression of that really hit. And I just, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And it's interesting because within each career that I tried to change, um, that didn't have anything to do with storytelling. I wasn't happy as much as I tried to make myself happy. Like when I did marine biology, I, I went and I studied for days and days on end. I, I, I had eight, nine, 10 fish tanks of different types. I had saltwater, freshwater pond, um, And eventually when I learned that I was forcing myself to be happy with it, I sold all of them. You know, I dropped out of that. And then I did herpetology. I worked at a uh, reptile facility. I, I I still have like 13 snakes in my room. And then I had lizards and, you know, and then I found out I was forcing myself to be happy with that. I'm just like, 
what could I possibly be happy with career wise? What can I, you know, and I had nobody to really tell me, well, why don't you do what you like to do? I never once had somebody like really tell me whether it was because someone just didn't notice and I wasn't vocal about it. Cause I know, for example, if I had talked to you way before, if I had someone to talk to like you way back then, I'm sure I would have gotten the advice, do what you like, or what are you good at, you know, and, and go and build up from there. But then finally, like four months ago, if not less, I'm like, I want to be a storyteller, but career wise, I don't know how I want to do that. So I'm, I'm researching and everything. And I thought English and literature, I've always been good at that. I've always been so fascinated with mythology and ancient history. I've always been so, you know, that, that one student that actually enjoyed English class, you know, I was that <laughs> overachiever in English class. And in high school, I always was staying after class with my, uh, with my English teacher. Uh, she and I would always talk about star Wars or we'd always talk about something Marvel or whatever the case was. And she also was a huge influence on my storytelling growing up. And so I thought, why don't I do uh, pursue education? Why don't I do uh, English literature, start out that way, and then eventually reach the college level and teach something more specific like mythology and, um, you know, how that has impacted society, how stories have impacted society. And after I did that for a bit, after I um, studied that for a bit, I found how happy I was doing a field that had something to do with storytelling that had some sort of relation to storytelling. And I know this is very long winded, but the, the point that I was trying to get to was that it doesn't matter how much you change your career. I've changed my career maybe nine or 10 times and I'm barely going to be 22. And you know, I've had so many people tell me, oh, you're so young, you're, you know, you're, you're barely an adult, you have a whole life ahead of you. And I never listened to those people. I always took it off or brushed it off as, oh, well, you're just an old person telling me this. And, you know, you don't understand. And then eventually, it took me a while to realize, like, well, most of those people, if not all of them, were in my position at some point, and they know what they're talking about. And <laughs> I had to really just tumble myself and realize, like, it's okay. I've barely started my life and my adult life, and I have so much time ahead of me. I've had friends that are in their 40s, or I have friends that are in their 40s right now that have just finished their degrees, that are just getting their degrees. They're just finding the careers they want. And that's what it took for me to realize, like, there's no rush. I don't need to be graduating the same year that my high school class did. And that was a big thing, too, was I was like, shoot, I need to do this. I need to I'm a year behind. I need to crank out classes and all these things. And I, I, I realized that I was running myself rampant at that point or ragged at that point. And um, I just I've learned that. If you're a young person, you know, or even if you're not a young, you know, not like 20, if you're 30, if you're 40, if you're 50, it doesn't matter. If you want to change what you want to do, if you're not happy with where you are, there's no reason why you shouldn't. You know, if it's, you know, if you're that determined to do something, then do it, go for it. And if you want to change that later on, you find out it's not for you, then change it. You know, I always thought there was something so inherently wrong with changing your careers. And, and I think it has to do with, I was more concerned about finding a, a, a quick stability with finding, okay, I'm going to get a house and I'm going to do this and I'm going to get a car and I'm going to do this. And it took so much joy out of life where if I balance the two, you know, stability, but also what kind of career or path do I want to follow? I found something where I can have a pretty decent paying career but also do what i like to do or teach about the things that i like and so uh i guess my sort of experience that i could try to pass along if anybody was going through something similar would be it's okay to change and if you don't have people that you feel that support you ask because i guarantee you 
99% of you probably have at least one friend or family member that will support you. You just have to be vocal about it. And I know it's very hard. It was hard. It took me three, four years to vocalize that I wasn't happy, that I wasn't truly happy doing what it is, whatever it was that I was doing, or that I felt alone, that I felt like no one was at my side. Um, so I think just speaking up about that and speaking up about like, if you feel like you're in a, you know, in a place where you're like, I don't like my career. I don't know what to do, but you have this almost societal pressure of you have to be this and you have to be that to be successful. Um, I think success is really just gauged on you and we shouldn't be measuring it off of other people or off of a specific number of how much you get paid a year or anything like that. But I know that was really long winded, but I hopefully I got my point across on that. No, I want to, touch back on some things you brought up you mentioning you know when you're graduating high school and you feel like you have to graduate college the same time that your peers did that was me too i had to take a gap year between high school and college because at the time my parents were getting divorced and you know i decided i'm gonna take a gap year that way it can help take care of things at the house and for a while i was really almost insecure of all my peers are going to graduate before me. I'm behind. I'm a failure. You know, I'm starting at a JC college transferring to a four year. Like everyone else I know went to a four year. Like, does that mean I'm inadequate? Am I not good enough? Blah, blah, blah. And now I it's already been a year out of college and I'm like, who gives a fuck? Like, who yeah. cares? No, like, and the thing, like how long it takes you to go through school, as long as you're on top of your stuff and you're working hard, maybe you change your major a couple times. But what your point of do what makes you happy, that's so important. Like for anyone listening out there, think of your friends that are doing a career because they feel like they have to or they know because it's good money that they're doing it. But do they actually like it? Are they happy? Think like don't don't make like a comparison trap of like, oh, boohoo on them, but really reflect on that and ask yourself, do you want to be in that position? Do you want to just work a nine to five just because it's secure and you'll make money and stability? Or do you want to do something that actually makes you happy? And like for us as creators, we picked one of the worst majors or career paths on stability. Like, yeah, I'm out here a year out of college. And so like, I don't know what the hell I'm doing with myself. <laughs> <laughs> this podcast is the only thing I've got going right now besides a job coming up. And but I know if I wanted to do corporate work or work in an office, I would be miserable. I would hate it. And yeah. why am I going to invest all my time and energy into something that doesn't serve me? I'm not going to be like maybe 110% at, or I'm just going to be miserable and coming home and exhausted. And so it's the thing of doing what you love, even if you know it's a very narrow path and you have no idea how you're going to get there, that takes a lot of cojones. That's so much courage on, you know, you know like I'm going to stick it out because I have faith in what I do. And, you know, when you're able to do something you love and you make it there, you're not working. Like you're yeah. just living life and you're going to be so much more fulfilled. And so, like you said, it's hard. And to vocalize it, to ask support, what should I do? Then you want, like, like you said, ask a friend, ask a relative, ask a professor, someone that's a mentor, someone that's going to be real with you and just ask, what do you want to do? Don't be concerned of what your peers are doing or who's making the most money and what like to do with them or influencers on social media. It's all fake. It's not real. Like, just be focused on yourself. Don't get stuck in the comparison trap because yeah. you're, you're cheating yourself if you're doing that. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, there's some, it's interesting because you pointed out anything in a creative field is so different, uh, arguably one of the most difficult fields to go into because you can't just learn a book. You can't just read an employee handbook. You can't just read these guidelines and be good at it because with most other with like corporate jobs or retail or anything you read a handbook in a week you do a little bit of practicing and you've got the job down pat you can do it for the rest of the time you're there no question um 
And that's the job that I have right now. And I like the job because of the interactions with other people, but otherwise I'd hate the job. I, you know, and, and it's just being a creative is so much, so much. (laughs) There's so much that goes into it. And it doesn't matter whether you're a writer or whether you're, you know, the third assistant director or whether you're a costume designer, whatever it is that you're doing in a creative field, it's important and it impacts people, even if they might not inherently see it. And, you know, one thing I was, it was funny. One thing I was looking at when I was watching a movie, I was going through all the credits and I was realizing like, you know, and I knew this more than maybe the average person, but even I still had a realization of there's a lot that goes into making a movie like one movie <laughs> there are so many people involved and you know sadly sometimes there's even people that go uncredited um but it's just so crazy how much time effort money blood sweat and tears all of it goes into making a single two and a half hour movie and you know i think that's important to realize is if you were a creator again, it doesn't matter what you're doing. It's important. It's going to make a difference in whatever that project is, whether you're the head of the project or you're at the quote unquote, the bottom of the totem pole in the eyes of whoever's making the project. Um, You know, and I think that's another thing too, that I had thought of was just, you know, even if someone doesn't directly say thank you, or if someone doesn't directly say, you know, I appreciate you or what you do or, that gratitude isn't direct. It doesn't always necessarily mean that it isn't there. Um, And that's something I also had to struggle with for a while was just learning to accept that not getting a direct compliment is not the same thing as being insulted or is not the same thing as them saying your stuff is bad. Um, But yeah, it's just, there's so much that goes into this type of career, into this type of field. You have to have, you know, a, a mindset of you, you have to want to do this to succeed and not just want, you have to go and get it. No one's mm-hmm. going to get it for you. No, you know, you can have all the relationships and, and, and collaborations you, you want, but at the end of the day, you're going to be the person that decides your fate. You're going to be the person that decides if you get into this position, you're going to be the person that makes your demo real. You're going to be the person, you know, and so on. It's always going to be up to you. Everything else will be factors that you can't control or minimally control. Everything is going to be up to you. And so as a creator, you know, you not only have to have the time and you have to sacrifice maybe not being stable for a while, maybe not having a whole lot of money, but you also have to sacrifice, you know, letting other people do it for you or learning how to do it from a single book or handbook you have to think outside of the box and you have to be willing to suffer with any, well, not suffer, but you have to be willing to learn with any challenges, consequences, or anything that comes your way. Because while they may be negative at face value, they're more than likely positive in your growth and in how you approach things later on. So there's just so much that goes into being a creative and, you know, maybe that's why I'm not doing it in terms of actually being in you know, the film industry or being in the professional podcasting industry. And it's not because I I don't feel like I'm successful, but I think for me personally, it would be a little too much. And I would lose sight of my storytelling and, and really how simple I want it to be. I don't want it to be anything too intricate. I don't want it to be hindered by you know, corporations and the way and their agendas and the way they want to make my things. Um, So if I end up making a story one day that gets funded and I don't have to sell it to someone or I don't have to, you know, have some corporation sell and it, it gets big by myself, then cool, you know? And if not, also cool. I still made it, you know, whether or not it, I made it with a huge budget or if it got, an award or not or whatever, I still made the story and I'm still proud of the story. And I think you will be your, your story or your project, your art piece, whatever it may be, will always 
would we'll, we'll, we'll be 10 times more likely to be successful if you go with the mentality of I'm doing this for fun. Um, you know, and you don't have to, that, that doesn't necessarily mean you have to not give it any effort or treat it like it's just a fun project. You can put all your effort and passion into it, but if it stops being fun for you, you're going to have a miserable time. It's not, it, it's not going to be fun. And it might turn out that that project, if it's no longer fun for you, will turn out to be something that you really don't want. And so I think for me personally, that's why I couldn't go into the professional industry uh, in that sense, because I know to some degree I'd have to change who I am or change my stories to get in there or to really, you know, flourish at first. Once you're there, you know, that's a little bit of a different story, but, you know, and sometimes people don't have to do that. Sometimes people just make it by doing the stuff that they do and being who they are. And I'm not saying that you can't do that. But for me, at this point, I would rather just tell a story, have two people be fine with it. And then if it hits big somewhere, then cool. You know, um, that's what works for me. It might not work for everybody else or anyone else. But, you know, if it does work for you, if it works for anybody out there, I, you know, that was loud. Uh, there's nothing <laughs> wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with staying simple and staying. Um, what's the word? Simple. There's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the last thing that I kind of thought was just simplicity. There's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with telling a short, fun story or telling a story that's been told a thousand times, but just in different interpretations. There's nothing wrong with if your story is seen as simple by people, there's nothing wrong with that. There really isn't. There's no need for it. Now, intricacy can be good. You can have really cool and really lore heavy worlds and all these other things. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. And you should go for that just as much as well, if that's what you want to do. But if you're somebody that just feels like they want to have a fun time telling stories or have a fun time making a media piece or an art piece, then go for it. Don't listen to other people. Don't listen to this idea of, well, I want to make it a career. So I'm not going to do it because, you know, do, do what you want to do and everything else will really follow after. If it is, I don't want to say meant to be, but if it see, if it seems like that this is a good path for you, then take it. And if, if you're telling yourself, you know, this really isn't a good path for me and I'm not happy, then follow your gut. 99% of the time, your gut is going to be right when it comes to this type of stuff. Um, you know, and for the one or two times that you might not follow your gut and it turns out great, good, you know. But always, in, in my opinion, listening to your gut is really just the best way to go about a creative field. If someone's giving you a red flag and you know, you know that doing anything else with this person is going to really put you in a bad place, probably shouldn't do it. Or if you know that submitting your show in this awards is going to make you look really good or it'll be successful, you'll know you'll get, you know, whatever, then go ahead and do it. You know, just follow your gut. I'm getting way too complicated with it. Just follow your <laughs> gut, do what you want to do. Uh, don't let anybody tell you no. And if someone tells you no, you know, I guess listen to why they're telling you no. If it's for a good reason, maybe think about it. But for the most part, if people are just being negative, just to be negative, that's always going to happen. And part of being a creative is learning how to overcome those negative interactions and also how to learn from them, how to use that criticism for your betterment. I don't know. I'm starting to lose. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I think everybody understands what I'm saying. I'm, I'm starting to lose <laughs> the way I'm talking, I don't know what's wrong with me today. Maybe it's just because it's super hot outside. I don't know. It's very warm. This heat wave all over is just way too much. But I wanted to kind of touch back on what you're sharing about do we want to do if, like, I guess my point is if the way you act, if your character is being compromised because people are making you feel that you have to be a certain type of way or that your projects have to be a certain type of way for them, like, cut it. Like, you're not yeah. obligated to do stuff for other people if it's 
not what you want to do. Like I had to learn this this year. I had an inter- internship with a much older guy, a producer. He wanted to do documentary. And, you know, I thought like, okay, really good experience. I can finally have some out of school experience about it. And eventually I realized, well, one, I'm treated really poorly. One, because I'm young and this guy just thinks that, you know, knows everything, which is fine. Obviously, has more experience than me, but telling me that, like, my work is okay at best when he hasn't watched it or just, you know, cussing me with work I've been turning in and stuff. It's just something, whether you're a creator or industry, respect yourself and know your worth and how you should be treated. If someone's so, treating you less than, then when you know your worth cut it like there's no need you're not you don't you're not stuck you can there's other doors that will open and just wanted to kind of tie that into it you're saying like stick true to your character to how you are and don't let people try to manipulate you into thinking you have to appease them when yeah. you're just cheating yourself yeah no i you summed up what I was trying to say in 10 minutes in like two minutes. And I appreciate that. <laughs> um, for me, it's, and, and that's, the, that's another thing too, is I just, I, I, I try to have patience with myself when I'm put on the spot or not necessarily on the spot, but like, if it's something I haven't written out, if it's something that I haven't practiced or read for hours and hours and hours or days, you know, sometimes I'll really just shut down grammatically or i'll shut down and you know i always feel like i annoy people because i'm i'm saying um like 10 10 000 times or i'm staring off into space or i'm not making eye contact and it's all because i'm trying to think of what i'm trying to say and or i'm trying to envision how the conversation is going to go before i say it um so that's something weird that i've always had an issue or not an issue with but um i had to learn also as well like it's okay. Just say what you got to say and you're good. You know, they're not going to hate you because you took a, just 10 seconds to explain yourself, you know, 10 seconds longer than normal. And if they are getting mad at that, then that's not your problem. That's their problem. You know, um, I think everybody thinks differently and we all communicate differently. And um, it's just important to really understand that you know, I'm not going to communicate the same as you and vice versa. And someone listening is probably not going to communicate, communicate the same as either of us and having that patience and having the, excuse me, the willingness to understand or trying, trying to understand what someone's trying to say, that's going to get you so much farther and that's going to make a positive impact for both of you. So just a little side thought that I had about talking because I can't get a word in inchwise and you know what I'm trying to say. I I can't talk. Uh, I, I I can't. It's it's hot outside. All right. I I I don't know. Um, yeah. I think. And it's not really me being nervous. I'm just. Sometimes it's hard for me to really vocalize what I'm thinking. It's there. You know. I know it's there. Whatever it is I'm thinking. I know the point I'm trying to get across. But. I think I get scared of saying it the wrong way and maybe someone might misinterpret it. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I, I think that's something I just need to get better at is just say what needs to be said and then just leave it. You know, don't think 10 times about it. Uh, Cause that's gonna, that's gonna kill you. But that's always something that I've had is just overthinking things and, and just, not going with the flow. I think too hard about things and I've always done that. And so I don't know if you have advice for not overthinking things oh. other than just not overthinking things. I don't know. That was just a little side thought. Yeah. yeah. No, I have definitely been the queen of overthinking and that really ties into my anxiety where I'm really just ruminating and okay, what does this mean? How did that be interpreted or like what's happening? And There's a balance of think before you speak, like be self-aware. How is it going to come across? But also don't overcomplicate yourself where you end up getting stuck and flustered. And so 
it kind of goes back into your intuition and just being self-aware of yourself. What is your intention with what you're going to say? Is it necessary? Say it. If it's not necessary, then maybe you don't have to say it, you know? And right. just being self-aware, maybe thinking, okay, if I just said it this way, how would it come across to me if I was hearing it from a different per person? And just using kind of yourself as a way of, if I heard this with this affect me differently or would I interpret a wrong way? Yes. No. Okay. And then you get to be able to figure out how to adjust how you're saying, but yeah, like anything, there's always a balance of, you know, don't just speak out of your ass and then like say something offensive and then wonder why people don't want to talk to you. Right. <laughs> but then also don't overcomplicate and get worked up of how you to say things, not the wrong way. And then you just end up saying things the wrong way. And so, I, my my advice to that would just be don't get worked up you know whatever you first think just reflect on it like okay it I what's the intention and why am i saying this if there's no ill intent or malice then okay say it and yeah. if someone takes it the wrong way then you hopefully they have the communication skills to com com communicate with you on okay where did we misinterpret and then clear it out later Right. Yeah, that was just a little side thought that was me overthinking. Um, so I tied in really well to that. But yeah, no, I, I and again, I think overall, just kind of going back to what I was saying, just, you know, not even just being creative, but just living life in general. It's a lot, you know, and we put too much stress, stress on ourselves in simple things like speaking in simple things like just saying what we're trying to say or what's on our mind. And I have troubles. I have troubles with that every single day. Um, and in some situations I'm perfect at it. I'll just say what needs to be said, get to the point done. Mm -hmm. But then there'll be other times where like, if it's something I really want to talk about, if it's something I'm really passionate about, or if it's something that I'm trying to articulate my thoughts about, I'll just think, 10 years about it and then someone I'll, I'll lose whoever I'm talking to. Uh, and I've had people tell me before, you're like, okay, get to the point or you're babbling, get to the point. And I don't take it uh, as an insult because it's, I would like to know when I do that. So then I can, you know, change that uh, for future or learn that for future reference. Um, but anyway, yeah, all fun stuff. Um yeah. Sorry. I'm, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, at a, I'm at a plank <laughs> trying to think of if there was anything else we had said or if there was anything else that you wanted to say. Or No. Uh, thanks for being on the pod. And thank yeah. you for the times you've reached out and gave me feedback on the episodes. I appreciate it. Yeah. No. And thank you so much for having me on it. It's been, it's been really fun just kind of talking. I haven't been able to really talk to anybody in this manner for a while, a long while. Um, and it's so refreshing to really get what's on your mind out, to get some advice and to just talk to somebody, even if it's somebody I haven't, in this case, somebody I haven't talked to in a couple of years <laughs> and I've never really talked to, to begin with, you know, I, I think, you know, friendships and, and things that, will be helpful to you can sometimes come out from the weirdest places. They can just come out of left field. You know, you might have someone reach out to you one day and that might make a whole world of difference for you or for them. Um, so it was so cool being able to be on here. I know it took a little bit for us to schedule it. Um, 20 episodes. Wow. That's, that's, that's really, that that's awesome. I'm, I'm really excited for you and for this show and, uh, you know, I hope it does get a lot more attention because I feel like it deserves it. I feel like having all these different perspectives and having people, you know, talk about themselves and their experiences and maybe advice that they have and just a sort of collaboration with two people creating a collective thought is something that I think needs to be listened to a lot more, especially with the topics that you've been covering, you know, from things like imposter syndrome to mental health, uh, and, and, and so on. And just, it's so important to talk about these things. And I feel like that they're not ever talked about a whole lot. Um, and they're not as widely known. And I think 
if this changes anything for one person or if it makes one person feel better about a situation they're in, then I've done my job. You know, mm-hmm. I, I've done, uh, I feel gratified in that sense and I'm happy and then move on, you know? Yes. But uh, thank you so much for having me on here. It's been, it's been really awesome. Sorry for babbling on for quite a bit, but. Oh, that, that's the point of the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> it's your episode, Babble On. But yeah, no, thank you. And thanks everybody that's been listening. This is the 20th episode. I, to be honest, I, well, my goal with this podcast is to, to do it as long as possible. But when I first uploaded the first episode, I didn't think 20 episodes would come here this quickly. And it's been really cool uh, for anyone that's listening. If you have a story you want to share, your perspective, please reach out message me email me anything love to have you on the podcast or you just need advice please feel free to message reach out this whole point of the podcast is to create a community where we're just supporting each other and learning from each other like this podcast is just everyday people sharing their story and thanks to david and everyone else on the podcast thanks for sharing their story so yeah it's been good having you on (laughs) thank you so much cool well okay thanks guys again links in the bio like always if you want to help support, if you go on Anchor, there's a button where you can click support and or submit questions or messages. So please feel free to do that. That'd be awesome to hear. All right. Well, thanks, guys. We'll see you in the next episode. Bye. See you.